Hey everybody, it's Stephanie with The Learning Project. You guys, I'm so excited with our next podcast. We are going to be interviewing Kira Bauer. You, re- you might remember her from one of our past podcasts, but you know, I wanted to highlight her again because she's got some exciting things going on right now. Um, and I wanted her to share with us a little bit about a project called Raise that she is doing. This is going to be a, a really awesome and transformal, transformational, um, I think, movement in our community. And I just want to learn a little bit about what you're doing and how people can support and be part and all of it. So Kira, tell us a little bit about RAISE and what is it? Sure. Um, so just give a little bit of history. Um, 2019, the Department of Commerce did a study and they found that Black students in Spokane, Washington were some of the most underserved as it pertained to early childhood um, education. Mm. So they approached a group of us here, uh, just community members um, here in Spokane, and they said, hey, like, how do we fix this? What do we do to kind of close this gap? Mm -hmm. Um, We kind of brainstormed, uh, had a couple of brainstorming sessions. Um, And in that, I expressed uh, just an idea that I had been working on probably for about the past maybe eight, nine years, um, and that was uh, to create a preschool that is culturally based from the perspective of the Black American. Um, this is not something that is unique to, to, to me or even to Spokane. We have several culturally based centers here in Spokane. Uh, we have the Salish School, the Pavlish School. We have a couple of uh, Hispanic based programs as well. Um, but we don't have anything for the Black Americans. And I think mm-hmm. that in this, um, these turbulent times, we very much need to uh, bring the view and bring the, um, the understanding of what it means to be Black in America, but um, really start at a, at a younger age. And so that's where this idea um, kind of came forth in this project. We applied for the needs-based grant and we were awarded uh, about $64,000 for that. Awesome. Um, that those funds were then um, then allowed to uh, be used for the next phase of the study, and that was the feasibility study. Uh, the feasibility study basically um, just asked the question: Is this feasible? Is this not just something that is needed, um, but is it is it viable as a business? Um, will the community support it? Yeah. Um, Black Americans in Spokane are only 2.9% of the Spokane population. And so mm-hmm. it really couldn't just be a project that was supported um, within the Black community. It needed to be accepted and understood by all, and not just from the social aspect, right, um, but also from a fiscal aspect as well. Um, so we won the needs-based grant, moved into the feasibility study, which we actually just wrapped up last month. Awesome. Um, and just had a lot of great interactions within the community. Um, we conducted a couple of uh, focus groups. We had a survey out. Um, I did what I call the, the uh, Black Church Circuit, where I went around and, you know, spoke to uh, congregations and just gave them information about this project. Mm-hmm. Um, and really just reached out to the community um, to get their feedback and, and their understanding. Um, and so that is over the, the course of that time, the race project um, really began to take form based off of um, not just my experience being in the childcare industry and, and seeing the need um, for not, not just of the Black student to understand who they are and, and their, um, their people's contribution to our country, but right. also seeing the need of the community at large for that um, in that same vein. I want to put a pin in that really quick, sure. sure. Um, so one of the th- questions that probably is coming up in some people's minds is like, okay, so is this a school only for Black students? Um, and why is there such a need for us to know um, African American history or Black history when it is, you know, it's everywhere. We have a whole month. So mm-hmm. what do you kind of say to that? And uh, how does this study this this event program all of it kind of fit in 
Absolutely. Uh, so unequivocally, no, this is not a program just for black students. The, the purpose of the RAISE project is to raise, R-A-Z-E, eradicate, demolish the narrative of the black student. Um, there are several studies, um, one most prominent study um, done by Yale University found that implicit bias very much uh, influences the outcomes of Black students in their yes. in the classroom. Yeah. Um, I know you're familiar with the study, um, but what that, that study showed is that it actually didn't matter the ethnicity or the culture of the teacher. Um, the implicit bias, meaning what we are, what we know, quote unquote, um, yeah. just based off of our living experiences and, and what we've been taught in a systematic way, um, influences how we view and how we teach and how we support Black students. Um, so this really cannot be a project just for Black students, because if we, you know, I, I use, I, I often say, if all of us sitting around the table are all in agreement that black people are great right mm -hmm. we're having that conversation amongst ourselves and it's just us black people having that conversation um so there are some very important aspects being left out and those are the people that don't understand yeah. um what it means or what it looks like a holistic view of what it looks like to be black in america absolutely um, I'll, I'll say this it was said to me um over the course of, of my research and, and reaching out to the community, um, there was an individual that said to me, she said, Kira, if there was a 50 year plan to eradicate racism, she said, this program is it. And mm -hmm. it really goes to the point of, you know, if you're starting with people who are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, they've already had that, yeah. that subconscious training, right? right? But if you start at this preschool level across the board, regardless of cultural background, socioeconomic background, and you put it, you know, you mentioned we have a whole month. Well, to take one month out of the year means this is something different. This mm -hmm. is something not norm, right? Mm -hmm. um, black history, black culture, black influence, black input, is the norm in America. And the problem mm -hmm. is, is that we have, and, and I, I don't want to say a problem because Black History Month is very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Because of where absolutely. We're at. Um, but the contributions of Black Americans needs to be ingrained in the fabric of who we are as Americans and right. not just put into one particular month. Um, right. And so to end the short answer to your question is, is this for everybody? Is this just for Black people? No, this is for everyone. Black students are going to absolutely benefit from it, but so are your white students, so are your Hispanic students, because they're going to get a full view of their American history. Black, Black history is American history. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think one of the things that we have to continually remember is that history and um, influence of other um, people have been left out in the educational field. We call it a very Eurocentric educational style of system. So, you know, when we have that, um, that system set up in a certain way, it really leaves out or it sends a message unintentionally or intentionally to the students. And so I want you guys to uh, remember a couple things. There is a, um, an, a, um, documentary that focuses on colorism um, and they specifically focus on children um, and they focus on children of color and they look at how they see themselves, how they view themselves compared to other people. Um, and it was a very interesting um, segment because so many of the students hadn't been exposed to like racism, but because of the, um, the signals and the um, the messages from TV, the conversations that they heard from other family members, um, as well as what they thought about themselves in general and who were the smarter kids and who were not the smarter kids, um, they already knew it right away. There is a, um, a lady, she says something, she says, take a child into a preschool room and ask them who's the strongest kid. Every single preschool student will raise their hand and say, I'm the strongest, I'm the strongest. And then she says, as they get older, they start to learn about the world and how it sees them and how they 
um, how it all shapes and who who is who. And she says, you go and take them into a, a first grade classroom and ask them who the strongest kid is. And they will actually point all to the same kid. And they will say, that kid is the strongest kid. This kid is the smartest kid. This They've already learned to label and see things in, through a certain lens. And so um, I think it's really important as we're having this conversation about rays is that remember that there's been such, there's been no lens or a foggy lens um, or a half lens when it comes to Black American history um, and all of the different pieces that race is trying to demolish. And I love that you're using that, that word. Um, what are some other areas that you guys are focusing focusing on? I really feel like there are definitely social justice issues and everybody knows that or the learning project is about um, social justice issues in early childhood education. So um, tell me a little bit about some of the areas that you guys are also working um, in that you feel that will help build a bridge for our students. Mm. You know, I, I think anytime that you are looking at uh, healing or rebuilding or um, really solidifying something, you start from the inside and you work yourself out. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I really wanted uh, to focus on in creating the environment uh, for this program was what are some things in our community that we are struggling with and, and having that very open and honest, um, almost self-reflective is how, kind of how I thought about it within, from a community standpoint. Um, and I wanted to try to meet those needs. And so, um, you know, one of the things, one of the biggest things that, um, actually, no, I'm going to start with something else. I'm sorry. I'm going to work up to the biggest thing. Okay, yeah, uh, no. I think uh, a belief that the parent is the first and most important teacher um, and a commitment to honor and incorporate their parenting style into their students' academic life. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things, and even for myself, uh, being a, a Black American parent, um, is that oftentimes the parenting style that we innately have from watching our parents and, and the, the stories that we've been told, which our culture is a very, um, you know, we, we pass Story down goes. a lot of our information, yeah. uh, generation to generation, a lot of that is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is, is, you know, is taboo in today's parenting um, realm. And so I yeah. think first and foremost, we need to let our parents know like you're, you're a good parent. Um, yeah. These things that you are doing meet certain needs of your students. And there is a reason why um, black excellence is a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so we need to recognize that and support support that um, yeah. and really get away from putting our parents into this Eurocentric box of what it means to parent and how we speak to our children and how we interact with our children. Um, obviously, we, as in anything, you want it to be done in a healthy way that is Absolutely. promoting um, you know, cognitive and phys physical uh, development and, and, you know, all of those things. But First and foremost, we need to recognize the parent and, and support that parent because they are the first and most important teacher. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to create a culture of futuristic dialogue and experiences as it pertains to higher education, wealth building, career placement, and healthy living. Mm -hmm. um, this is a conversation that is already happening within the Black Absolutely. community in, in such large um, doses. And so we want, as, at RAISE, we want to just undergird that and really support that. Um, we also, you know, one of the, the, as I said earlier, one of the biggest things, you know, as I went into this project, you know, I was going off of all the things that I've heard and been taught and researched, right? And that was um, that Black males need Black males hmm. to mentor them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I hit the ground running with that. Um, I was a part of our program is to have a full on mentorship program for black males by black males. Yeah. Um, and I really started uh, working on that um, over in the course of the a uh, focus group that I had that was just black males. Um, I get chills even just thinking about it right now. Uh, one of the men that um, that was in that group, he said to me, he said, Kira, 
He said, I'm going to challenge you to step away from what the media has told you, mm. which is Black men are absent mm. from their children's lives. He said, I'm going to challenge you to step away from that. He said, I believe that Black boys need Black men to mentor them. He said, but he said, here in Spokane, he said, the Black men have always shown up. We've mm -hmm. always been around. We've always mentored and undergirded our young Black men. And I know this as I, um, I've i been privy to, to seeing these Black men within our community. Yeah. Um, and this just kind of, again, goes to the, the implicit bias and the, the systematic way that we are taught to, to view our, our, even our own people, our own cultures. Right. Um, and he said, I'm going to challenge you to think on this. And this, and I promise you, this was something that had entered my mind, but I was like, mm, you know, I, I have a little girl and I don't know that. Yeah. Um, he said, I'm going to challenge you to think of the relationship between black men and black women. Mm. That young black women are so disenfranchised from black men. Hmm. He said, what we might need are black men to mentor, love, and nurture young black women. Mm -hmm. I mean, Whoa. that was something that hit Whoa. me like a ton of bricks because. Whoa. I do see black men mentoring black boys. And yeah. we talk so often, you know, even just in my social circle, we talk very often about um, the, for lack of a better term, the gap between black women and our trust and our faith and our uh, feeling of worth as yeah. it pertains to the view of black men towards black women. Mm. and um based off of that conversation based off of the feedback that I received and I and I just want to say and this was something else that really hit home for me the response from the I believe it was, there were eight black men in that yeah. group the response from the black men when I I began speaking about the absence of black men and, and all of these things was visceral they were so angry that this was still a an ideal yeah. when many of these men have actually dedicated their lives to supporting and mentoring black males here in our community and so um that is one thing that i can say i think wow. above all uh, throughout the research and throughout everything that um i've done over this feasibility study um, going in thinking we needed a program, yet another program yeah. for Black men to, to mentor Black boys and really understanding and having that brought to me by, um, and as a Black woman, right, having a Black man say to me, I need Black women to know that I see their worth. Mm. And I want to show that and teach that to young Black women, I think, um, was just powerful. Wow. So those are some of the things that we, wow. some of the few things we're working on. I was trying to be real quiet, y'all, because I was like listening to this and I'm like, how many times have we said this, right? And I, I have to agree with you. You know, when I think about a lot of people I know, um, their father is in their life in some sorts of manner. Um, there may be some people that are like, I wanted my father to be more present in this present way. Mm -hmm. um, that goes into a whole nother level, which is like, what trauma has that father experienced? And is he parenting out right. the best that he possibly can right. because with the tools that he has? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just so interesting that you brought this up. And this was something that was talked about in this, in this, in this, in this arena, um, because we always talk about the absence of Black men. Um, and I want to make something clear, too, because in education, we are so feminized. Meaning there's such a woman driven kind of perception. Women can nurture and love any child, but men are only allowed to nurture and love boys. And so you hit that so hard on the head. Um, and then when we look at these young women or we become women ourselves, we like, we don't even know what that love looks like because we have this huge gap 
um, and understanding what it looks like for other people to be exceptionally okay with um, showing us love and nurturing. And then also too, we have to talk about the stigmatism of rape and molestation that is usually pinpointed towards a male. And granted, you know, there may be statistics that say men do this, but there's a lot of women out there that are doing this too. <laughs> um, yeah. You and I both work in early childhood education. Um, if people knew half of the stuff that actually happens in early childhood education and the things that we deal with and the things that we need to address as a community, um, we, we, people would be in like uproar. But that because we don't peel back those layers and we still see lady, women as these ladies that are dainty flowers or nurturing and loving, they could never do any of this. Um, we're missing a whole opportunity of bringing healing and bringing gap, uh, bringing a bridge to a gap that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, I'll never forget when I first saw uh, this little baby. He, he, his father was not in his life, but when he first saw this male in the classroom and they had a beard, he freaked out um, because yeah. he had only been around women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, when he was like, what is this creature, you know, and we were just laughing and that um, guy was like, I'm going to make it a mission every day when I come in here, when I come into work, you know, I'm just going to come in and speak, speak to the baby and play with the baby, interact with the baby. Um, and that really made a difference in that little boy's life. Cause then at that point he was like, oh, hi, you know, I, I know that you are somebody that's different and you nurture, you love and you're a safe person. And I think that's really hard for us to, to recognize and bring to light uh, when we're talking about working with children, because we only see women as the ones that can work with children. And we're actually missing a huge gap. And I'm really glad you guys identified that. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to bring up while you were talking as well is because most people are probably like, okay, Spokane is very multicultural, okay? Like the family dynamic is very different. Um, how do you feel like this program is going to work for multicultural families? Um, and because not all their fathers are black, some of them are white, some of their mothers are black, some of them are white, some of them are different Asian, you know, black, what, whatever. Um, so how is this program or how do you see the vision of this program also working for those families and supporting that community? Absolutely. Um, so my family is multiracial. Um, my, my two children are black and their father is white. Um, so they're black and white. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that black is going to look different and it should look different for yes. everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that is being in of the same country that's something that's very unique to the black american mm -hmm. being a black american in the north is very different looks different culture is different from being a black american in the south yes. um i think what the focus needs to be is not so much on the differences of being a black american but what unites us mm -hmm. what have the contributions been yeah. um I often tell this story. Um, I grew up at the foot of my grandfather. There was no, but I'm, my dad was in my life and he was great. But my grandfather is the one that I, I was home with. Um, mm -hmm. He was the one that cared for me while my parents were at work. He's, he, he was my preschool teacher, mm -hmm. even though he only had a third grade education himself. Wow. Um, he, I grew up at his knee and hearing his stories and, and just the adventures that he went on. My grandfather was a cowboy, a, a mm -hmm. real life lassoing 10 gallon hat. You know, he wore cowboy boots to the day he died. Um, that was my grandfather. It is just something that is a part of who I am. And mm -hmm. so I love country music and I love, you know, anything that has to do with cowboys and, and you know, the, the work that they did. And um, it, it's something that resonates with me. And, and I am able to tap into that portion of being an American because yeah. how large of a part of being an American are the cowboy stories, right? right. Of the old West and all of those great, great things. Um, it really surprised me when I found out that there, that's not normal for everyone. Mm -hmm. Not everyone resonates with that. 
Yeah. Um, we don't, we're not taught something as basic as one in four old West Cowboys were black. Hmm. How, why are we told? Why are our children told that? Why don't we have photos of that in their yeah. classrooms and stories about some of the more famous black cowboys? Like, why are those stories not depicted? Right. Um, and so when we look at that and a child is biracial and, and regardless if a child decides that they want to identify um, as black or they want to identify as white or they want to identify as biracial as a biracial child, um, they, it's important that they know who they are and who they come from. Mm. We have stories day in and day out of what it means to be a white American. Um, yeah. And, and the contributions that, that come from that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you are Hispanic and Black, you know, you, you have a whole country and a whole, you know, thing that, that you learn about and all of these great things, your language is prominent. You know what I mean? You're hearing, right. if you're Black and Hispanic, you're hearing your language almost every time you call, a, you know, call somewhere you know you yeah. there's all these constant reminders of who you are we as black americans we don't have that right. um, or as those who are biracial don't have that and so i think the focus needs to be not on the differences not on the fact that you are a black american um you know from the south or you are a biracial black american what whatever the differences are that's not what we're focused on we're focused on the things that unites us, which is our history in our it. country. I love it. I love it. When you had brought this up to me about what you were doing with Rays and even talking about the lovings and talking about all of the different pieces that go into our history and stop really dividing everything up um, because that's really something that we're talking about now in this podcast, podcast series, which is you know, within our community, you know, there's not a lot of unification, you know, mm -hmm. people are here, people are there, um, people don't want to support, people do support, you know, but the thing is, how can we bring everyone together and be able to see each other as one, as a whole, you know, um, recognizing people's differences, because I think recognizing the differences is beautiful, but also saying that I see you as a part of me and you and I a part of you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that Blackness is going to look different for everyone, um, depending on the experiences that you have, where you grow up, how your family dynamic looks. I mean, there's so many different intersectionalities that take place in our families mm -hmm. that really make us all very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really love this part of Rays and what you're doing, because I think it's a huge issue within the Spokane community and figuring out what the culture of Blackness looks like in our community mm -hmm. and deciding to say, you know what, everybody can be included. Everybody is a part of this. And we see each other as a whole and recognize that we have different histories, but there are certain things that bring us together. And those are the things that make us powerful. Um, and we can highlight the differences, but we can bring it back to the uni United Peace. And I don't think we really have figured that out in Spokane. You're from California. I moved here from New Jersey. And one of the things that we always talk about is you can go to California and go anywhere and see all different kinds of people, hear all different types of languages, taste all different types of foods. You know, the, the, the culture is so grounded, right? And that's the same thing with me too in New Jersey. You can go all these different places and then you can taste and see and hear and explore the world with your senses right but when you come here to Spokane you're like eh, like what is this <laughs> how does this all work and what is Spokane's culture like like I can't even define it like I don't know if you can like it's something I've been talking a lot about and some people have been having no. able to like pinpoint but I can't define I it. don't I don't think there is a I mean what you just said is exactly what we're experiencing in Spokane, meaning in California, you can't define Blackness. I came from California, right? Mm -hmm. I, am, I am a country loving, tambourine playing, <laughs> church shouting Black person, right? I don't fit in necessarily these stereotypical boxes, whereas yeah. my sister um, my younger sister is completely opposite from me, right? Yeah. And we, the crazy thing is we grew up and we lived with both our parents 
Um, but she just grew up in a different time and even in a different location than I did by the time I left home, yeah. she was, you know, she was in a different environment. I think that is, I mean, if you really look at it, that goes back to the basis of who yeah. we, of what we've come from as black Americans, right? Yeah. Like we've come from all over and we've had to persevere and create and, yeah. and our own culture and who we are. And I think the beauty of that is that we still persist, that we still achieve, we still overcome, we create. Yeah. We don't, we don't just follow, we create culture yeah. wherever we are. Yeah. Um, that's what unites us. That's what brings yeah. us together. So when I look at Spokane, I'm not looking necessarily for a definition of Blackness because mm. we are, in and who we are, we are Black. Mm. It is literally just pulling out the beauty and the excellence of who we are. And that's another thing that as a, um, a early learning center in Spokane, we are going to be highlighting and focusing Black excellence in Spokane. Oh, so wow. for instance, when we do like our Community Helpers Month in October, we are going to be looking at, you know, our first Black mayor. We're going to be looking at the excellence with, of Blackness within the police force and within the legal system, right? We're going yeah. to be pulling out these Community Helpers that look like us. Yes. or look like our moms or our dads or the people whom we come from. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is how you define Blackness in Spokane. It is just us. Oh, man, you know what? I think you hit something. And I mean, it definitely goes along with this podcast series. But when you were like talking about pulling people out, it's one of the things that define the culture is understanding who's in the community, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what these conversations are all about is I think so many times, like we'll go on these different groups and be like, Hey, does anybody know any black doctors, any black dentists? Mm -hmm. Like we're looking for people that understand our experiences, yes. um, looking for that peer support, looking for people who will understand what we go through, how we navigate through the world. Um, but we can't define them. You know, it's like where, like, it's like Carmen San Diego. Like, where are you? You know what I mean? You're like, where's Waldo? Where, the, you know, <laughs> like we're constantly asking where these people are versus like, how do we connect in such a organic way? And I think that is so awesome that you're talking about that, which is recognizing people at a very, uh, for children, recognizing people at a very young age, understanding how our community is built and grown. Um, there is a book, I wanna give it a shout out to this book, it's called um, Black Spokane, I'm reading it right yeah. now. Um, it's yeah. very good. Um, and it's really talking about, you know, just the development of the Black community in Spokane. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't even know that it exists, um, but um, it starts really back it's from the Carl, Mac uh, Carl Maxey, which is really awesome. This this individual that was passionate about this community and passionate about Black people. Can yeah. I just make a point to that really quickly? Yeah. Um, so take your as time. you were talking- this is, What's the conversation? You take your time. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about how, how do we connect, right? Um, there are some just, I mean, the RACE project is just an amazing project that's coming to Spokane. Um, but there are some amazing projects that are already here. So speaking yes. of Carl Maxey, there is the Carl Maxey Center. They have yes. an entire website, web page yes. now that is just black owned resources or black resources okay. here in Spokane. And so um, I just want to put that little blurb out there that this is an organization that, you know, they are helping small businesses. They are um, a 501c3 themselves, but, you know, they offer resources within the yeah. business community. Um, it's just so such a great, to use the word again, such a great resource um, yeah. within the Black community. And so um, how do we get connected and where do we start with the Carl Maxey Center? Get Absolutely. on their website and, and really peruse that. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that's also a huge thing, which is how do we, you know, elevate one another and really embrace these different projects and passions and dreams people have so that they can still exist in the future. You know what I mean? And I think that's a really hard thing is because we're such sometimes a disconnect in the networking process. You know, we're not telling each other about grants. We're not telling each other about how we can do this fundraiser and be together and make sure that, you know, this situation survives or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, and including everyone, it doesn't have to just be 
one solo group, but I think that because we are talking about a particular group, we are definitely focusing a lot of that conversation around it, but there's a huge opportunity um, to help that networking piece, connection piece, and um, really continue to elevate where Spokane is going right now. Yeah. Um, So tell us a little bit more about RAISE. What do you hope to see in the next five, 10 years from this program and how's it going to impact our community? Absolutely. Um, So first and foremost, uh, District 81 put out their, uh, what is it called? Kindergarten readiness grade book, I think is is what the report is called. Um, And they reported that 40%, first off, I want to make sure I have this number right. I believe it was, they had a 25% kindergarten readiness entry of that 25% of students in general, 40% of the black students who entered kindergarten were ready. So that means four out of 10 kids. Wow. Kindergarten. Wow. Um, When I tell you that breaks my heart, I cannot describe when we start looking at the statistics of what it means. Say that one more time for the, for our listeners. Say that statistic one more time. Sure. So, so twenty-five percent. And I want to. I, I don't have the statistic right in front of me, but I believe right. it was twenty-five percent overall kindergarten readiness entering kindergarten, um, and forty percent of the black students that entered kindergarten were ready for kindergarten. Were ready. We're ready. Only forty wow. percent. So, at, at ten wow. kindergartner, ten black students entered. Only four of them were ready for kindergarten. Wow! Wow! So you start looking at things like the, um, you know, seventy percent of students who do not have, or I'm gonna try to say this right, um, students who. Um, do not have a quality preschool education or 70% more likely to commit a felony, Mm. are less likely to own a home. Um, (laughs) They are, you know, more likely to um, need public assistance and and, and the statistics just go on and on and on. Right. Four out of 10 Black students that went to kindergarten were actually ready. Now, look at what the district is actually requiring for kindergarten readiness. And, and I say this as respectfully as possible. It's almost a joke. Right. It's things like, hopefully you can recognize the first letter of your name. Mm. If you see a hospital, hope you should know what, what that building is for. Wow. Um, wow. Four out of 10. Wow. So when you ask me what what do I want in the next five years, um, what we're hoping for is that we can see an 80 to 90 percent of students that are uh, black students that are entering kindergarten are ready for kindergarten. What we want to see our parents engaged and empowered to not just send their students, but go with their students to kindergarten and yeah. undergird them throughout that process. Yeah. We want parents to be empowered in who they are as a parent. Yeah. Uh, we talk about uh, code switching, right? We do mm-hmm. that as parents, mm-hmm. especially within the Black community. Oh, yes. We oh, say yeah. things like, wait till we get out of here. Don't get around these people. Mm-hmm. Embarrass me. You, wait till you get home, right? And then we're like, <laughs> Yes, Miss Parker, we will be, we'll be there, right? <laughs> right. Don't switch. I want parents to walk into a school and say, no, no, Miss Parker, right? You cannot grade my child based on X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Per his right, per my right, we yeah. should have been notified of this, this, and this. Yeah. I want parents to be empowered. I want them yeah. to know what they should yeah. be asking. Be able to advocate for their children. Exactly. Um, So these are the things that we're really looking for. And and even on the other side, I want the little white children and the little Hispanic children and the the Asian children to see, um, you know, the the little black child coming and and understand that her hair is that way because it's a part of her culture, just as we would see a hijab and we know to respect that 
or just as we would see um, the the jewel or of the the Indian uh, culture, and we we respect that. Yeah, that's what I want. I want people. I want it to just be a part of everyday conversation. Yeah. Um, and of course, that goes much deeper. You know, I want yeah. you know black authors to be recognized and and black paleontologists to be um, talked about within the school. And even if it's yeah. our students bringing that information to light. Um, yeah. I know that that's going to make a difference within the Spokane community. And so absolutely. And uh, what you're talking about really is breaking the canon. You're, um, going from that narrative of these um, dip people that we're typically talking about, typically they're from the European culture and they're used to, uh, you know, we're used to hearing about them quite a bit, right? But mm -hmm. there are so many more pieces to the world and mm -hmm. our students are not having access to them. And that may be because actually it is a lack of diversity, a lack of recognition, a lack of, uh, you know, even being able to say we, this is going to prepare them for college or prepare them for high school and recognizing those people that have put a lot of work into reading and writing and math and science and all their different contributions and being able to help a student recognize some of those people and understand what those pieces look like and also see people that they identify with but also when a child of a different race is in that um, arena and they see somebody that is from a different race that's a scientist or a mathematician they are already accustomed to that and understanding like wow that person, um, it doesn't matter what color you are, everybody can be seen in these different areas and arenas and you, it, you're, it's capable of somebody doing it. You know, people well, are able to do different things. Absolutely, and I think it, it also goes back to one of your earlier questions of how is this going to be beneficial to the community as a whole? You know, we talk about the fact that we are in a global market. Mm -hmm. um, our students, regardless of their race or socioeconomic background, should be able to walk into an environment um, and hold the same respect for a CEO that looks like them yep. versus a CEO who doesn't. And the truth of the matter is, is as our world continues to progress, these are going to be the, the um, the catalyst for our success. If you can't walk into an environment and have a Nigerian CEO or a Pacific Islander CEO sit there and you can't take directive and, and work with them and, and yeah. uh, communicate with them, yeah. um, then you're not going to have as much success as you maybe would, it, not maybe, but as you would if you had that that more open and diverse understanding of, yep. of history. The other thing that I want to say is that um, when we're looking at this, we have to understand that, again, this is beneficial to the Black student, absolutely. Right. But it also is restoring a history that has been robbed from mm. us as Americans. Absolutely. We, as Americans, have mm -hmm. been robbed of our culture. Mm -hmm. I think, again, when you put this in a one month segment, it becomes something different. Something mm -hmm. almost like when you know you go to, and I'm gonna use this in understanding the, the historical context, but when you go to the zoo and you right. look at those bars, you're like, oh, that's special. Yep. That's, that's exotic, that's super cool. Yeah. No, no, black history is not exotic. It's, yeah. not, it's not different. Right. It is who we are, and it has been robbed Absolutely. from us as Americans. And a program Absolutely. like this gives us our history back. I love it. I love it. I am so excited about this program because I think it's going to inspire other programs to develop and grow. Mm. Um, and this program is going to help uh, create change of mindset, community, all of it. Um, and so many people that even have uh, multicultural families, maybe they didn't come from that, that, that uh, piece of history or, or that race, and they're going to be able to learn alongside with their child. And I think that's extremely important when we're able to come into a situation and we're able to learn from one another and we're able to learn together. I want to thank you so much, Kira, for coming to this podcast segment. Tell us where can we find you? Where can we follow you? How can we support? Absolutely. Um, so right now you can find Rays on Facebook. And I'm going to bring up the site. Um, <laughs> 
Raise Early Learning and Development Center Spokane. So, or you can just do Raise Spokane. Um, and that will get you right to that site. We are doing uh, monthly newsletters and updates, giving you guys just an idea of kind of where we're at in the process. Um, right now, we are in a holding pattern as we are waiting for our federal 501c3 to come through. Okay. Um, we've been awarded grants already um, for this project, and we are still uh, waiting on additional grants and hoping um, to apply for one of the major ones here this fall. Mm -hmm. um, we are, uh, my information is on there, so any questions, comments, concerns, you can also find us um, at Raise Develop or Early Learning and Development Center at gmail.com. Um, and so right now what we're doing is we are putting together six subgroups, sub-research groups um, that are really going to focus on some of these pull-out um, areas of our uh, program and make sure that we are being true to our mission and our vision, which Wonderful. really in a nutshell is just to eradicate um, the implicit bias that is holding our country back um, and do our part to end the systematic racism and, and through education and, and knowledge. Um, so yeah, you can get on, get, um, go like our Facebook page and, and stay up to date through our newsletter updates. Um, and of course, we're always accepting donations. This, this is going to cost a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kira. You guys, don't worry if you're driving or if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, what did she say? All the information is down below. It's going to have a nice little bio. So make sure that you take a look at that. Let me know what you need how we can support you guys don't be afraid to reach out to me also so that you can be a part of our next podcast series and so that we can learn about what you're doing in your community to make a difference i want to thank you again guys again this is stephanie courtney signing off thanks for listening and see you guys soon